Hello and welcome to the TWA podcast, the Wrestling Alliance. I'm Jake Pugh. It's been a while. It's been a very long while. We had our pilot episode just a couple of months ago where I sat down and had a chat with Joel Redman. Very interesting conversation we had and we had some great feedback from a lot of fans as well as wrestlers from all over the UK. There's been a lot of stuff going on both professionally and personally, as to why we've not really had any content since. And, of course, we were hoping to be presenting some shows uh, this better part of the year. But, obviously, with uh, coronavirus restrictions and the current pandemic we are now in, uh, that is not going to happen. But we are, hopefully, once we are all good to go, we will be back in the new year. 2021 start it off with a bang and hopefully we will uh, get underway with some shows but we hope everybody is doing well and everybody is doing safe most importantly and uh, we are back on track with the podcast we have got some exclusive guests coming your way in the very near future on this episode I have the privilege of sitting down and talking to one of the best heavyweights in the UK today. It's going to be Crusher Curtis. I know Crusher very well. I remember meeting him way back on a show at Stamford Lee Hope in the in the Stamford Lee Hope ballroom. I'm sure he remembers that night very well for many different reasons. Uh, we're going to be talking about his friendship with the likes of the legendary Flatliner, who was a regular on TWA, uh, when he became the British heavyweight champion for LDN the full-time promotion that's been going on for over 10, 15 years in this country. There's not many promotions that can say they can do that, as well, apart from WAW and All-Star Wrestling, respectively. Amongst other things, all coming up in Episode 2 of the Wrestling Alliance podcast. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and we have all sorts of news and as well as some archive posters and footage that will be coming your way. And eventually down the line, we will be talking to the main man himself, Mr. Scott, the body Conway. So as for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation. It's time. It's time. It's Crusher time. My chat with Crusher Curtis. Hello, everybody. And this is the TWA podcast and joining me at this time is someone who I can honestly say is one of the best heavyweights in British wrestling today who will be making his TWA debut as soon as we get shows back up and running it is the one and only Crusher Curtis Crusher how's it going uh I'm I'm all right with that introduction you you did well there you left out uh the best looking man in British wrestling uh the hardest hitting heavyweight uh did I say the best looking man in British wrestling? You did say the best looking man. You can have that twice. I'm all right with that. Yeah, I'm good. How's you? I'm not too bad. Not too bad, mate. We go back quite a way, don't we? Ah, <sighs> yeah. We we kept bumping into each other on shows and stuff like that for quite a while. We always have to have our little show selfie. I'm quite all right with that. Yes, we. I think the first time I met you, actually, was when we did a show at the Stanford Lee Oak Ballroom. Many, many years ago, that was when I was extremely green and had no business being in the ring, but everyone kept using me anyway, and I just kept punching people, and people loved it. Yeah, well, that's what it's all about, <laughs> isn't it? It makes a change from a lot of the stuff that you see nowadays anyway, so... <laughs> I'm I'm very much different from from most of the stuff you see nowadays, but hey, I'm sure we'll go over that in a bit. So, uh, so how did you first came across wrestling? Had you always been a fan? Was it the British stuff that you got into, or was it more of the American scene? Actually, I just commented, funnily enough, on Scott Conway's Instagram, and he posted a picture of the Liverpool lads, a fan art drawing of the Liverpool lads that he used to sell as merch. And I remember going to, I think it was Bracknell with my dad. My dad would take us to, I believe it was all-star shows in Bracknell many, right. many, 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 many years ago. And I was a big fan of the British stuff then. But yeah, when I was a kid, it was, it was watching WWE on, I want to say Sunday, Sunday after what it was, it was Power Rangers first. 
and then it was WWE. And this oh yeah, was, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Uh, there, there you go. See the original. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is we're going back in the day of yeah. Like I remember watching um, the One Two Three Kids debut and uh, things like that. Yeah, this is going back a while. But yeah, no, I've always I've always been a fan. Always watched the old stuff. It was back on VHS back then, and I remember buying pff, Summer Slams and Survivor Series and just pumping them on the VHS and watching them, thinking this is great. This is this is amazing. All of these guys look absolutely unreal. But <clears throat> I never really entertained the idea of um, of doing it. It was only it was only when the the mighty joke James Kenner met me when we was doing judo once and he said like have, have you ever have you ever thought of doing wrestling and I was like no why oh, I, I train at uh, RPW Portsmouth School of Wrestling you should come down and I don't really entertain the idea of things like that but at the time they changed the way they do judo they kind of pussified it a little bit they, right. made, it, they made it a little bit more watchable but it kind of weakened it for me. And I, I used to like going on the judo mat and hurting people. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give wrestling a go. And yeah, I, I think I Facebooked him or texted him. And he said, meet me on this day. And I popped down there. And as soon as I walked through the door, I thought, yeah, do you know what? I can do this. So how long have you been doing judo for before you got into <laughs> wrestling? I started judo... I want to say 90, 93, and I got my first Dan in 96, I think, and I was doing it for England at the time, but then I dislocated my shoulder in 97, and then I stopped doing it, and then I kind of, it's one of them old things where you kind of stop doing it for years, and then you do it a little bit again, and then you go, no, I don't want to do it anymore, and then... I do it a little bit again, and it was it was on that uh, that forever cycle where I kind of thought, yeah, I'm going to do this again, and I went out and bought a gi, and then I went down to Portsmouth Judo, and then that's where I met James Kenner, and he absolutely obliterated me on the judo mat. That guy's got for for one of the worst wrestlers on the planet, <laughs> and I will say that because James Kenner's one of my best mates. I mean, he's a lovely guy. But to have him anywhere near a wrestling ring is, is ridiculous. He's so bad. But the guy is so good at judo, it's unreal. And he absolutely battered me. And, yeah, that was when I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. We'll put that to bed. I've got my first down, and I've done it for the England. So, yeah, we'll close that little chapter. It's a good thing to have something like that in, as background as well when it comes to doing training in pro wrestling as well, I think. And oh, any, any other sport, I'd say, as well. Crazy. I mean... I mean, with with judo, especially with the bumps in wrestling, I I I tell people I've got an unlimited bump card because the amount of breakfalls we call them in wrestling that I've done. I mean, we used to break fall on concrete and all of that business. So bumping on the floor in the ring, off the top, it just there's no difference to me. I can. I've got a good, I've got a good bump wherever you kind of throw me. This is why I kind of suggest a couple of crazy things every now and then, just to keep everyone guessing as to what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're not, you're not your stereotypical big man that just won't take bumps either. You're, you know, you're pretty open to bumps for anybody, really, if it if it feels right, anyway. Yeah, I mean, as as a big guy, I mean, my job is to kind of kick the living life out of whoever I'm in there with. No one wants to see me do silliness or, or crazy chain wrestling and stuff like that. I mean, I can do that. It's not a problem. But people people will want me to punch someone in the face and do really nasty things to them. And I like to keep it fresh. And I'll, I'll bump if the situation calls for it. But in the same breath, if if we're in the locker room and we're putting together a match and you're coming out with silly suggestions and craziness, I'm going to shut that down real quick, shall I? Yeah, and it's a good thing as well because there's not many people that would do that either. How, how long would you say was it that you had your first match uh, just after you started training? So, 
I I was lucky because down at Portsmouth School of Wrestling, they kind of they they kind of kept me on a short leash. I always wanted to go 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 go, but they was no no no. You you'll debut when you're ready. You'll debut when you're ready, and and it was more. I mean, I hear the same from trainees nowadays. They go ah. Oh, I've been training three months or four months. I'm ready for a match. So like, Listen, pal, I was training three times a week for at least, I think, a year before I even got a sniff of a run-in or anything like that. I mean, they, they, they looked after me. They didn't let me do anything silly. Old uh, Andy Quilden and Andy Simmons, they kept me on the short leash. But it was my first match was for All-Star down at uh, Bognar, and it was in a tag, funnily enough, with the Mike Yoke, and we went against Justin, Justin, is it, no, Justin Starr and Danny Driscoll, I think, yeah, that's it, that's those two, and um, I, I got the shout for that, I don't think it was planned too far ahead, Andy Simmons, he phoned me up and he said, right, I've got you your first match, you're on, and I went there. I had no idea what I was doing and I met Danny and um, Justin and they said, listen, you know, what, what's, what's your experience? And James thought he was going to the WWE at that stage, so he thought he was better than what he was. And I, I was honest, I said, listen, I ain't got a clue what I'm doing, but, you know, I've been training for this much. And they said, OK, no problem. And they must have given me about 500 things to do and James got, like, maybe two or three things to do and... I said to him, I said, listen, I'm not too sure if I could do that. And the the amount of talent that those two guys have, they looked after me in the ring and they made sure everything was done and everything was good. And it was a really good match, to be fair, for my first match. And I was buzzing after that. I thought, yeah, this is, this is something I can do. This is something I can have a crack at. It's a good experience as well for a company like All Star as well, because not only does it have the prestige, but I think it's one of those promotions as well where it's very, very clever in the aspects of less is more. So just your presence is pretty yeah. much just what's going to get you over, if you know what I mean. Definitely, definitely. I mean, All Star, All Star is deep rooted in British wrestling. But not only that, you look at who's who of massive WWE stars and they all say, listen, I've done a summer run for Brian. I've done All Star. I've done All Star. And... Yeah, it is very much. I mean, there are there are positions on the cards everywhere you go for craziness, but with All Star Wrestling, it is very much about your entrance, about establishing heel and face, and getting over with the crowd first, and then, I mean, depending on who you with, like you've got the likes of Dean Allmark, who's one of the best wrestlers in the UK, who can who can wrestle a wrestle a cup and it'd be a really good match or Joel Redman, who's a, a really good wrestler. Those, those two do crazy skilled matches. And then there's, there's other guys who just do less is more. And, I and rem- they look the part as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember, I don't know how many times they've done it. I dread to think, but James Mason and um, Roy Knight, every time yeah. those two get in the ring, I remember them sharing a uh, half a match or a full match on Facebook. And I commented with, this should be a match that's shown to every training school everywhere with, this is how you do British wrestling. And, and I think it was Roy who said, dude, we've done that match thousands of times. And this, that is your bread and butter of British wrestling. It is less is more, less craziness and more giving the people their money's worth. I completely agree with that. And another promotion that you've also done many work for in the same kind of aspects is uh, LDN, where, of course, you've become the uh, British heavyweight <laughs> champion on two times, I believe. And would you say that that was where, because LDN being a full-time promotion as well, so you managed to get out there every single week to work a crowd, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, with I'll I'll say this, and I've told this to a lot of people, LDN is where where I learned my craft, where I cut my teeth. Because before I got into LDN, I was maybe wrestling once, twice, three times, maybe four times a month. But I did a show for LDN on the Isle of Wight 
and it was short notice. And um, Sanjay Bagger, who's the promoter of LDN, he said to me, listen, I like the way you wrestle. He, he, he put me in the main event that night and we absolutely smashed it. And he said, listen, I've got, I've got dates. Do you want to do them? I said, yeah, send them over because I was saying yes to everyone at the time. I just wanted to get my face out there. And um, so yeah, they within a day, I think it was, they sent me their whole run, every single show that they were doing for three months. And he said, right, you can have any of these shows. And without even looking at it, I said, I'll do the lot. And then that was it. I was doing like three, four, five shows a week at one stage. And it is just match after that's that's how you get your experience and this is why i say to people when they say i'm a wrestler or or i'm a i'm gonna teach wrestling and stuff like that and then they say something silly like oh i've had 20 matches or i've had 50 matches it's like you are you are still just getting started you need to be well over 100 200 matches before you have got any bragging rights i mean there's trainees out there that are bringing out their own merch and they haven't even had one match yet. I mean, that's just yeah. craziness. But yeah, LDN is where is where I cut my teeth, learnt my craft, and and thanks to LDN, I I believe I can go on with anyone on the planet, hand on heart in any promo, and and not do myself an injustice and um, beat the living snot out of someone. That's it. That's what I like to hear. And you know what? It's it must be bizarre though when you look back, especially the amount of time you've been in the business now. And when you see younger guys coming in and they're talking about what they want to do, they might try this out. They might try out that. It must be it's com completely different to the background that you had. You must sit there and must think, "Hang on a minute, this wasn't the way how I was brought in." Yeah, I mean, I've I've been lucky with some of the locker rooms. I've been, I've been in with really experienced guys, and I've been in where I'm the most experienced guy, which is kind of strange because I haven't been doing it, what, 10 years, I don't think. And I mean, yeah, I was lucky early on with my RPW locker rooms where you had the likes of Andy Simmons, who works for the WWE, and he's almost kind of overseeing everyone talking. And as soon as he hears something silly, he goes, listen, you ain't doing that. This is a family show. You've got... 50, 60 people in the audience, they don't want to see that. That's just craziness. And and for me as well, I've been in some locker rooms and uh, I've had to put a stop. Like I'm on, I'm on second half or I'm on just before the interview and I'm listening to the first match and the guy's going, oh, yeah, well, we'll, we'll duck one, we'll jump start, we'll brawl in the crowd, I'll hit you with a chair, I'll, I'll come off the top rope and... And we'll we'll go up and down the stands, and it's like, dude, you're on first. What on earth are you doing? Rope that in now before I grab you and shake you. And yeah, like, I I don't know whether it's bad education or people getting excited or training schools not training their students properly. But I mean, like I said, back in the day with RPW, they were very much know your position on the card yep. and and know what you can do, but. Just because you're on first and you don't have to do much doesn't mean you can't have match of the night. I've I've gone on first, set the tone of the boo yay, and I've had people come up to me at the end of the show going, your match was great. And I've not done more than three or four moves to my opponent. I've hit him more than once. But I've given the crowd what they want. I've got interaction going on. You're rubbish. No, you're rubbish. And everyone's had a laugh and a joke and... All of a sudden, people are coming up to me going, your match was great. It's like, I've, I've not done anything. I've, I've literally taken one bump and done yeah. maybe a suplex and a power slam. But it's knowing your position on the card and not being an excitable, skinny, flippy wrestler. Absolutely. Now, I'll tell you one question I have to ask you now. Where did it all begin with you and Flatliner? <laughs> Listen, you, you, I, I, semi, I semi don't hate you so you can ask me whatever questions you like just be <laughs> careful because i've got no filter i don't swear but i don't care who i upset where did it begin with flatliner i met i met flatliner through uh rpw and he did some of the local shows and i remember i remember seeing him in the gym 
uh, a couple of times because we, we used to train in the same gym every now and then. And I was very serious when I go into the gym. Like, I don't like laughing or joking. I'm in there for a reason, and he's in there laughing and joking. And uh, him himself, he'll, he'll go, Jesus, that guy was really serious. But I'm, I'm in the gym for a purpose. And we met through there, and then I got to share a locker room with him first at RPW. And <laughs> I, give him, I give him my beard comb because he was, oh, has anyone got a beard comb? Anyone? And I give him mine. And he was like, oh, yeah, thanks, thanks. I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And I sat there watching him with his wrestling and I thought, yeah, that's really good. And then all of a sudden they said, you know, you should go on with Flatliner. And from pretty much Matt one, match one, I've been belting the living life out of Flatliner and absolutely loving it. And, uh, and uh, who's got the more wins out of each other? Is it definitely you? Do you know, I dread to think how many times we've wrestled. Over, it's got to be at least 20, 30. And I, do you know what? I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't keep, a, keep a track of how many wins or how many losses. I mean, let's have it right. I'm winning more than I'm losing. But I, oh, go, course, in there with, I go in there with the attitude of I want to be remembered after every single match that's gone on, whether I'm first or whether I'm last. I want people to go, damn, that crusher was pretty good. And that's, 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 my, that's my aim for the match. It was, it was Martin Stone. Danny, uh, what's, what's he in WWE now? Danny, Danny Birch. Danny Birch, Martin Stone, one of the very best wrestlers this country has ever churned out. And I, he's, he's one of the best in NXT, uh, Raw, or wherever he is now. He said to me one day when we was doing a wrestling seminar, he was saying, look, listen, everyone knows this will work. But what I do is I try and entertain the dads in the crowd because the dads don't want to be there. They have brought their kids to the show and they're going to get bored. But he said, if you can entertain the dads in the show, they'll be the first ones to say to the kids, listen, do you want to come there again? And they go, yeah, sure. And that's kind of why that's a great my, outlet. my style is, is the way it is. Like, I belt the living life out of people. And when I belt people, the first thing dads do, or every bloke in the audience go, oh, Jesus, that hurt. And then I hear people go, it's all right, it's fake. And then I drag people out the ring, and I do it in front of them. I go, yeah, hold on, it's fake. Look, what's this? And then it's whip, crack, bang. And then they go, Al, do you know what? You really hit that guy. I'm like, listen, we're not playing Tiddlywinks, pal. Exactly. And you know what? That's a great outlook to have. And that's something that a lot of people should be looking at when it comes to performing on a show. I really agree with that. Absolutely. And going back to, so you, you know, Flatliner, Andy Simmons, of course. Of course, you're a good friend as well with the likes of the Pitbulls. And Stu Allen as well. You've done a bit of work at EWW as well. So that was where we managed to hook up again and uh, great shows to perform in front of, especially with a crowd of that magnitude as well. I, I like uh, the Pitbulls. They are, they are my wrestling brothers. God bless them. They are absolutely madder than a box of frogs. <laughs> I, I would, I, there are very few people in this wrestling industry that I don't even have to ask why I'm doing it. If Dave or especially Mike tells me I'm doing something, then that's it. I'm doing something. Obviously, sense depending on that. But Stu Allen again, he's one of he's one of the most respected, but he's also one of the nicest people I've met in uh, wrestling. And not to mention the things that he's done, going above and beyond, looking after British wrestling. Yep. Uh, especially with the speaking out movement and all of that as a whole. I mean, yep. that guy that guy deserves more credit than what he's getting. And it just, it offends me that he's not. But yeah, Stu Allen and Tarn down at EWW, that is just such a good atmosphere, good place. And their shows are ridiculous, especially with the venues that they do it in. That massive, great big shopping centre, I mean, that place gets absolutely rammed out. Yeah. And you've got the whole floor surrounded by people. You've got people hanging off the first floor balcony. And you're like, this is mad. Absolute craziness. And yeah, they, I mean, those guys, they know exactly know what they're doing. You, you know, you're working for a good promoter 
when at the end of the show they get everyone together and go right this is what we're doing this is how you're behaving this is this this is this this is this any problems come see us and they've got a grip of their product they know what they're doing and they're doing it really really well absolutely and a little story for you actually at one of the eww shows i was uh, lindsay mason is a really good friend of mine and the first time she ever watched you her dad was the late uh, crusher mason and when she said that she saw you wrestle for the first time she said that you reminded her so much of her father and she thought it was fantastic i don't know if she spoke to you after that or not i i met lindsay at eww and to be totally honest, my old school British knowledge wasn't great uh, back then. And she introduced herself and people were saying, oh, that's Crusher Mason's daughter. And I, I didn't have a clue who Crusher Mason was. And um, I just knew her as Lindsay. And she, yeah, we're, we're good pals. I mean, I'll give her a big hug and a kiss. And she's a great individual. But it was, oh, it was... Phil Powers, back in the day, he said to me, you look like Crusher Mason. And again, I didn't know who Crusher Mason was. And it was only when I, when I started watching some of his old matches, I was like, you know what, like, this, is, this, this guy can, can do it. And he looks the part and he looks like a really mean person. And obviously, for Lindsay to say that, not only am I extremely flattered, but I'm also very honoured as well. There's a few people in uh, British wrestling that I'm, absolutely devastated that i never got to meet and never got to do any matches with and crusher mason is is one of the very first people that come to mind along with uh, the likes of drew mcdonald and people like that i'm absolutely gutted that i never got to hang around with those guys and kind of sponge off their knowledge and stuff like that but yeah no i'm i'm extremely flattered for lindsey mason to have said that that's uh that's that's cheered me up no end I'll tell you what, I know exactly what you mean by that, because especially at EWW, I always get the chance to catch up with Jace the Ace, uh, who was, of course, Jinx, and uh, he really looked after me, and he didn't even have to, because I was just the MC and the commentator, but he always took the time to listen to what I did, and always pulled me aside and said, maybe try and do it like this, try and do it like that, but he always would uh, also tell me stories about sharing a changing room with the likes of Giant Haystacks, Mark Rocco and things like that. And I think, God, I would have given anything yeah. to share the locker room with people like that. Yeah. Would have kept, would have kept the mouth shut because I'd probably be cracking myself. But at the same time, it would have, you know, would have been an honour. Take me take me back to those old days. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more of an old school guy. And JC AC he is a prime example of how crazy talented someone can be for someone that looks so normal. The first yeah. time I saw JC Ace, he came in the ring at RPW and he wore a vest and track pants. And I looked at him and I was like, who the bloody hell is this? This, guy's, <laughs> this guy looks like he's just walked off a building site. He looks like he's trying <laughs> to tarmac my drive. And he did, he did the session and it was all good and stuff like that. And it's only through looking at some of his old stuff and speaking to him. And he is incredibly talented. Like, I... Very few times I ask people to watch my matches. Jace the Ace, whenever he's in a building, and he always knows, I'll always go up to him and I'll say, Jace, have a look at my match and pull that apart, will you? And he's also one of the very few people that realises watching a match isn't patting you on the arse. I'm going to tell you what you did right, but he's also going to tell you what you did wrong. And then he's going to yeah. give you a couple of options. No he's pissing about with him. Maybe do this, maybe do that, where a lot of people, and this is why I've stopped kind of asking people, if you say, ah, oh, watch this, and tell you, like, let, let me know how good it is. Like, you know, what, what, what's my match and give me some feedback. And you go out there and you come back and go, ah, oh, Christ, that was brilliant. That was great. That was great. And you go, well, right, okay. Anything else? No, it was brilliant. It's like, I know it wasn't brilliant. Why are you trying to tell me it was brilliant? I'm looking for criticism. I'm always looking to get better. And JC Ace is one of those very few people that is old school that will give it to you right. And again, you saying with the old school locker rooms, oh man, today is just... Some locker rooms are like pulling teeth. I'll go to a show and everyone's got their earbud earbuds in and all they want to do is talk about New Japan and Raw last night. 
Whereas old school locker rooms are all about having a laugh and a joke, catching up with your pals, you know, playing pranks on each other and talking proper wrestling and getting better at wrestling. And back in the day, if they told you to do something and you didn't do it, you got thrown out the locker room and you were really lucky if you didn't get thrown out the building. And that's, that's something that's what's missing in British wrestling. I mean, you can't do that stuff nowadays, but sometimes when I'm in a locker room, I'm looking at someone and I'm thinking, I'm going to grab you and throw you out of this building if you don't shut your mouth. <laughs> well, as you said, you know, guys like JC Ace, Flatliner and the Pitbulls, they were all regulars on TWA shows. Now, when shows are up and running again, it has been confirmed that Crusher Curtis will be joining the Wrestling Alliance roster. And uh, are you? how excited are you about joining a roster of a promotion that's so prestigious and uh, working for someone like Scott Conway? Having spoken to Scott a few times, he's someone who definitely you know, knows what he's doing when it comes listen. to promoting in this country. It's not many people listen, that do that. listen, 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 listen. I'm, I'm a new school wrestler with old school values. And everyone used to talk about Scott Conway this, Scott Conway that, he's in Thailand this, he's in Thailand that. Never heard of the bloke before. Never knew who he was. You know, I, to be honest, I weren't really interested. People were saying he was a really good promoter in his shows. Were, were just spectacular back in the day. And then I finally met Scott Conway on an LDN show in Borden or Hazelmere, it was. And he was introduced to me by Sanjay. And it's a guy of, you know, medium height, medium build, oldish fella. And I said, hello, how are you? You all right? Yeah, not too bad. And I've got to be honest, within... Within maybe five minutes of talking to this fella, I absolutely loved him. Some of the stories that he was telling and some of the ways he was saying that he deals with stuff and some of the shows that he's ran and stuff. I can I can tell when I meet someone in the wrestling world, you know, what kind of person they are. And Scott Conway is one of one of my people. He his knowledge of the wrestling business, but not only that. He was telling me a story about, I think it was Virgil or Marty Gennetti or one of those people. And this is why this is why I really liked him within five minutes. He was telling me that there was a story of Virgil or Marty Gennetti when they were doing their tours. And he was saying, yeah, you know, they get to make money out of their Polaroids and stuff like that. And I mean, this is before, you know, that's, that's the meet and greet thing from back then. I was going, all right, okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And he was saying that, it, it was either Virgil or Marty, you know, they were dragging their feet. They were always late and he maybe give them two or three warnings. And in the end, he left them at the hotel and traveled up without them. And they, and they had to travel, travel up by themselves, get to the show. And they was like, Oh, well you left me behind. And he was like, well, listen, you're late. I've told you to toe the line. And then they said, okay, no problem. And then he said to them, well, I'm getting someone else to do the photos tonight. You're not doing the photos. And they said, well, but we make loads of money from the photos. This person ain't going to make as much money. And he said, I don't care. You need to toe the line or you just ain't doing it. And you that's know, what he, being a professional is all about. He, he is financially losing out, but he is having this worldwide traveled wrestler who's wrestled in God alone knows how many people arena. He's telling them, listen, I'm the boss. You do as you're told or you're out the door and you ain't earning as much money and they soon fall in line. And that attitude is absolutely golden in British wrestling. I've known some promoters that will let talent absolutely walk over them. Most guys cry when they get told who they're going against with or who's winning or who's losing. But Scott Conway, within yeah. five minutes, I got a taste of who he was. I got a taste of what shows he wants to do, who he wants on them. Proper talent. He doesn't want any silliness. And within five minutes, I thought to myself, I really hope this guy is serious about running shows because I want to. I definitely want to work for him. And within a couple of weeks, I heard whispers that he was interested in me. And then he got in touch with me and he said, right, as soon as I get back doing shows, and this was before the silliness hit, he said, as soon as I get back doing shows, you're on. And I'll, I'll listen. You don't know me. We've had a couple of conversations. We, I think we chatted for a good hour or so. And I said to him, like, you know what kind of person I am. I know what kind of person you are. I'm really 
really excited to work with you. I'm ready when you are. And it, it genuinely, I mean, it, it takes a lot for me to get excited in the wrestling world now. I mean, wrestling is, is fun for me and is a job for me, but to get really excited is something that was, you know, I don't often get excited, but when I learned Scott Conway was going to be running shows and he wanted me to be on them, like, yes, let's have a bit of that. And you'll be joining a fine roster as well with your, with your pals, Flatliner, the Pitbulls, Justin Starr, Kid McCoy, Johnny Storm, Jody Fleisch. It's a who's who. Joel Redman as well, James Mason. It's a who's who of British wrestling. So it's definitely something I'm looking forward to seeing you work up with those guys as well. I, I am very excited and I can only imagine, depending on who you... I mean, you could put me on with whoever. And you're going to get your money's worth. But put me on with a really good wrestler. You best watch out. That match of the night's my spot, and you need to you need to work your bottom off to try and get that off me because I've I've pulled off some absolutely horrifically blinding matches with some really good guys. And I can tell just from talking to Scott Conway that he isn't interested in hiring people that aren't ready for that show that don't know their play. He, he's only interested in working with wrestling professionals, and I absolutely love that. In my, in my humble wrestling experience, people need to realise that you need to be of a level to be on a show, and you need to be on the next level to be on better shows. And, you know, you, sometimes on a card, and you look at a fella and go, wow, you're, I, you know, I hope the other person looks after you, because... I personally don't think you were ready for that. But I wasn't ready for it. And like I said, the boys, Justin and Danny, looked after me. But already all that these TWA shows are going to be absolutely spot on. And I'm generally excited. I can't wait. Couldn't put it better than that, my friend. And I think that's going to do it for today's episode. So, Crusher, where can people follow you on social media? Well, if you're looking to follow one of the most hated people in British wrestling and someone that loves to get told off and loves to point out that uh, skinny, jumpy, flippy wrestlers need to go down the gym more and less of doing silly card push-up things and just get some weight on them, it's uh, Crusher Curtis on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Listen, if you just type Crusher Curtis in on any of those Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it'll come up with my profile and you'll know it's me because of the stuff that I post. Well, that's going to do it for us. Crusher Curtis, thank you very much. Been emotional.